Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first of the 2020 Web 3D Consortium webinar series. My name is Vince Marchetti, and I'm going to be presenting the first webinar, which is entitled Learn X 3D. I'm glad you all came. Uh, Want to say that one purpose of this consort of this webinar, besides introducing you to some basics of X3D, is to introduce you to the work of the consortium and encourage you to find out more about the consortium, and perhaps even to join. If you, we offer a lot of services to uh, the wide range of the X3D audience, so I believe that uh, a link to our uh, the the web page describing this webinar is in your chat room and from there you can navigate to the join uh, the pages describing the consortium's work. Uh, we have a lot to do today so I want to get started right away. Uh, let me introduce myself. Again, my name is Vince Marchetti. I am a, me a member of the Web3D Consortium. I'm on the board and I'm a co-chair of the Design, Printing and Scanning Working Group. We've been thinking about putting together this kind of course uh, for a long time. It's, if you, it's really intended really for a, a wide range of expertise. Uh, I, in a moment, I'll give a curriculum, but my broad philosophy or, or goal in, in putting this together was to give, and I, the way I think about it is a direct route to uh, publishing an X3D scene, though not necessarily the shortest route. So I'm going to give uh, a kind of a pathway to creating an X3D scene and then putting it on a web page. Uh, particularly people who are familiar with this, I'm sure will say there's a better way to do it, there's a shorter way to do it, there's different tools to do it, and that's great. Uh, those of you who either members or, or in the audience would like to contribute those kind of thoughts, I encourage you to put it in the chat box rather than, uh, if, if you have an urgent question, uh, you know, there's something that you didn't understand or something is wrong with the presentation, let me know right away. But uh, the, the comments about there is a better way to do this or a shorter way, I completely agree with you and perhaps we'll have time in a question or discussion period to talk about that. Let me jump right in. I've divided this webinar up into three parts and there'll, there'll be a short break between the different parts, just you know, two or three minutes for me to get a drink of water or perhaps adjust my screen. But I like to go straight through. Uh, the, the first thing I, well, let me describe the, the three parts so you have some idea of what's coming up. Uh, the first part I want to talk about is just building a basic scene, and this is really going to be basic. It's going to be a simple block that you can spin around with the mouse. But I want to use it to introduce some basics of uh, the X3D terminology and the way it works, including the idea of different encodings and the kind of tools, simple tools with which you can build an X3D scene. The second part makes a perhaps a big jump in sophistication because most people want don't want to put just blocks and triangles and, and cones in their scene. They want to put real artifacts or, or very complicated geometry. Usually geometry which is made by some other tool. It might be a, a CAD model, it might be data from a scanning run. Most X3D content really isn't made with the base, with the primitive geometry I'll be demonstrating in part one. So an important topic is how do you bring in X3D content that was created or edited or modified by other uh, tools? And I'm going to be using an example of a, an, a 3D model which was published by the Smithsonian as part of their open access program and I'll be converting it uh, into XVD using the Mesh Lab tool. This will be a part where I'm sure a lot of you will have uh, suggestions or 
other tools we can use. Uh, and I hope that we, we can at least mention those, but I really wanted to be specific and, and discuss in some detail a particular tool, in this case, MeshLab. And my final uh, the part of the webinar will be to at least look at adding some extra features that really make 3D scenes useful, and that is make them interactive and making them dynamic. And at the same time, be introducing a platform called Glitch, which is a great platform for learning uh, and getting examples of these more advanced techniques. So let me start back to part one. I'm gonna quickly check the chat and I don't see anybody raising any uh, problems, so we will continue. And I'm glad to see that we have a, a good sized audience. Okay, the first thing I want to do is just make a very simple X3D scene, and I'm going to do it using the most basic of tools, a text editor, and I'm working on a Mac desktop, and my text editor is BB Edit, but there's no special features, and any text, basically any text editor will, will work fine, uh, because sometimes these 3D scenes get large in, in sort of character count, you might want to uh, an editor which handles large files. And the other tools I'm going to use is just a, two of the common desktop players, View 3D Scene. Uh, that's part of the Castle Game Engine. And this link, or I, I should say that this PowerPoint slide set will be available uh, and you can find these links or you know, a, a search for View 3D Scene will bring you up this. Uh, how to, how to get this tool, an instant player. And just as a aside, there'll be one point in which I use Python, but again, I'll be pointing out that there are several other tools which will do the same thing Python uh, will, will be working for. And the references, uh, I'm going to be going a little quick and, and, and not going in great detail about syntax and the exact naming of the different entries, I really want to give you a flavor for how to build one of these scenes by hand. So uh, refer you to the, the standard documents, uh, which, which give those in detail. Open my folder for my basic scene. Let's see if I, I can zoom in on this. I don't think you can really zoom in very well. Um, an X3D file, at least in the common encodings, is just a text file. And within the text files, there are, there are two really f encodings or formats that people use. One is the classic vermal, uh, <coughs> and the, the other is an XML format. The, again, the path of which I take was start creating my scene with the vermal, uh, classic vermal encoding, uh, and then demonstrate how you can, how you can uh, convert from vermal to X3D. So right now I'll give you the, the reasons why I would start with vermal. One is it's quite a bit uh, more human friendly or human editable than XML. You'll see that it's a fairly simple syntax. We don't have the confusion or the, or the uh, complication of all the XML opening and closing brackets and, and uh, a whole plethora of quotation marks around attributes and a lot of rules. So the vermal is actually easier to, to sort of hand edit uh, your initial scene. And I've broken this up into several steps. And, and again, the, the these files and, and folder structure will be available on our webinar after, after the webinar for your reference. Uh, I've, let me open this in my text editor and make sure, okay, I've got it pretty big, big. The starting point of an X3D scene or in vermal is just the, the basic declaration 
that it's an X3D scene. We're, version, we're working with version 3.3, 3, uh, which is the, the latest version, the most recent version, which has gone through the ISO standardization process. And the UTFA just indicates that uh, this file is encoded uh, in UTF-8. And that is the accepted standard for X3D files is to encode both the XML and the Vermal in UTF-8. The profile, I will not go into detail now about what the profile means, but just as a real basic level, there are several levels of complexity for an X3D scene, and immersive is about the most capable. Uh, there, there are thinner, uh, smaller, narrower profiles, uh, but at this point, I, I just choose the most expansive profile, and the, the most of our X3D browsers will handle the, the immersive profile just fine. And the last step is a, a meta statement. It, there are several meta tags uh, which, you, which you, the author, can use to give some basic information about your scene. Again, I'm not going to uh, go in great detail about what the best way to use it. Uh, that's in, that kind of information is available in our resources on the consortium website. But I just included one tag here that says what this the description of this file, it is a basic example, and that's what it is. I won't bother opening this file because there's really nothing in it yet. So let me go to the next stage of complexity. And I've lost my folders. open this file and add the first thing. The first thing I want to add to my file is just something to look at. And uh, X3D has a number of uh, simple geometries that are available. And the example I choose, I just want to show a box. Uh, and the size is perhaps explanatory. This gives you the three dimensions of the box. Uh, they're in X, Y, Z order. So if you imagine the box is, you know, in an X, Y, Z coordinate plane is going to be, uh, the side will be length one along the X direction, length two along the Y direction, and length three along the Z direction. That tells you the shape, that tells you the size of the, excuse me, yes, the size of the box. And the next simple, uh, property of something which you would see in your scene is uh, really simple, the appearance. What does it look like? And I'm going to choose the, the simplest uh, way to describe the appearance. Appearance is that it's just going to be made of some material with particular color properties. Uh, the, the colors are specified with red, green, blue uh, values from zero to one. So the diffuse color, which basically just says how light light bounces off it in a scattering way, I'm setting the as a red, pure red box with a red value of one. And for the specular color, which describes how light bounces off of it, uh, I'm giving RGB of one, 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 all basically white, meaning all colors are reflected uh, comparably. And this, since there is a, now there's something in this scene, I can try to open it. And so on this system, on, on my Mac, I can open a box just by saying open with, and I'm gonna choose to open it in the view 3D scene browser. And there it is. Now you say uh, it's a red box and it's kind of white. And I can turn it around. When you look off, off center, it's still a red box. The reason why it has this white glare is that it is a standard feature of these browsers. If you don't have any lights in their scene, they kind of apply a headlight as if you, the viewer, had a headlight on your helmet. And in the View 3D scene browser, we can turn that headlight off 
with a hot key. So I'm gonna turn the headlight off. And with no light, well, the, the shape disappears. And actually the, the this View 3D C browser has a feature that it shows a, a bounding box or a box and I can turn that off. So without that, you just see the, with the headlight on, you see the red box. And when you're looking directly at it, you get that mirror effect where the headlight is bouncing right back in your eyes. That's because you're looking at that head, at that face head on. Well, that's not very, I mean, that's a scene, but probably better, more useful if we didn't have to necessarily have the headlight on. So let me move to the next stage of my building the scene. I'm gonna add a light. And probably best if I get rid of the old scenes. Now let me add a light with my editor. Okay, I've got a, the same header. I've still got my shape. I've just added a point light. Uh, it's exactly what it looks like. It's a light, which is a point source and it, it shines in all directions. I didn't talk about where we are and we'll talk about viewpoints in a moment, but just save time. I'll just say that uh, when we opened that scene earlier, we were located at at zero zero ten that in x y z coordinates so about about ten, and we think of them as meters in x three d. We were located ten meters away from the box uh, along the z axis. So what I want to do is put a point light just above my viewing, just above my head, five meters above my head. So at x zero y five meters up, uh, ten meters out. The intensity is on a zero point, a zero to one scale, so making it a fairly bright light. And the ambient intensity is, a, is another quantity, which just basically gives you an additional environmental light. And all these things can be modified, again, to, to make your scene visible and useful for you. So now let me open up that scene with the light on. And let me find in my other browser, the Instant Player browser. Okay, so this is a, a, a different browser from View 3D Scene. And, and I, I do this just to, again, highlight another uh, feature of the X3D standard is the, the file is written to a standard and there are multiple independent viewers for looking at these files. And there are several, uh, out there, and in, and in a few moments, or in a little bit later, we'll talk about the browsers which are used on the web. Now, if you, oh, I should have mentioned about the light. I, I made it a blue light. So that gives, that gives us some idea of the lighting effects. There's a, a blue light above my head so that's why uh, now that this scene looks a little bit purple because you're combining the red, the red color of scatter light and the blue kind of mirror off it.
Yeah, Vince, you still there with the audio? Uh, it sounds like you're muted. Well, that's Vince's audio. Vince, can you hear me? So, mm, nope, we're still not getting your audio. That's odd, it was working. Um, Sounds like your audio started up for a second there. It's maybe the batteries in your headset. Well, I'm, I'm, it's not batteries because I am, can you, can you hear me now? You're back on, yeah. Okay, I, it wasn't batteries because I'm using USB uh -huh. and, and God help us, maybe some USB <laughs> decided it didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, good okay. deal, thanks. Okay. <laughs> See, I didn't use batteries. You know, batteries wear out. And now we got this crazy USB where if it goes off for a, a 10 milliseconds, it reconnects. I apologize, everyone. Um, I don't know how long I've been off. Um, I think we had just um, loaded the second example in Instant Player. Okay, I, l l let, let me move on. You've, you you ha hopefully have seen the, 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 the silent movie version of it, and uh, let me move on. <laughs> uh, I should have had subtitles. And, and I, I've also got the little bars on, on my other screen so I can see that the microphone is transmitting. Let me move on to the, uh, the part where I add a viewpoint because that's an important part of making your scenes usable is, is not just necessarily always looking at your geometry from, from head on, but perhaps at least make the first view that the viewer sees interesting. Open this in my, my text editor. Get rid of this one. Okay, so the, 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 the next element I've added is a viewpoint. And actually, I haven't added any details about the viewpoint. I know in a minute, I'll explain why or how. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll add is a, a background, just because, and this is just a matter of personal preference, I don't like the dark, the, the black, having in my objects float in the, the blackness of space. So in a moment, when I load this one, you'll see that uh, the color is yellow. Now the, the viewpoint just says that, describes where your initial place of looking at it is. And in a moment, we're gonna set an actual position and in what direction it is looking without those specified this scene is going to open up with the default that is looking at it from 10 meters in the front. And my microphone is still working. <laughs> and I'm going to open this with instant player again. Okay, and again, we see the uh, yellow background. I'm going to make it large. And again, this is our, our red box and we can spin it around. Now, one thing about navigation, the, the simple navigation model is that 
when we do things like uh, grab onto the box with the mouse and uh, move the move, you know, apparently move the box, we're not actually in this simple case actually moving the box or really moving our own viewpoint. So if we had to fix the coordinate system, you'd see the still box, the box was still in the same X, Y, Z axes. It's just our place has moved. So in a, in a sense, where we are, our, our point of view and our, the direction which our eyes are pointing has changed. Now, this is not a very interesting box that the viewpoint matters that much, but I'm in a, when we get to the OBJ example, the viewpoint will be, you know, maybe more significant. So I'm going to imagine that this is the way we want to look at this box in the beginning. This instant player browser gives you a good way of uh, determining where you are located right now. And that's available in this instant player using the, the space bar. And it gives you kind of a heads up display with a lot of data if I can zoom in, what we see, and at least for in terms of setting the viewpoint, the interesting, the values of interest are this POS position, which is three Cartesian coordinates, and the rotation was essentially, and you'll see that it's actually called orientation when we enter it into the X, into the vermal scene. Those are three angles. Now, unfortunately, I don't think that there's a, and you know, maybe, Nick, maybe Nicholas knows uh, any convenient way of, of saving those values and pasting them into the vermal scene. Uh, so I'm just gonna write them down here and then type them in. this out of the way, you can go back to my vermal scene. Thanks, Vince, and <clears throat> just a quick question for you. Um, yes? You, you had mentioned uh, that you were usually talking about those Cartesian coordinates um, in meters. Uh, when we're talking about those orientations, what, what kind of units are those? Oh, uh, I, <laughs> yes, the, the, those, are, those are radians, mm -hmm. and they are also, they are, not getting into all the ways of representing rotations, but they are not Euler coordinates. <laughs> that's, a fast, that's the easiest way to put it. Um, I actually, I, I, I see what you're getting at, Nicholas, and I, and I misspoke. There actually are four rotation coordinates. So in this representation, uh, the first three X, Y, Z are the, uh, coordinates of a normal act of, of an axis, which is a unit vector. And then the final number, this 1.1, 1 .1, well, essentially 1.19, is a counterclockwise rotation about that axis in radians. So um, I will say that in authoring this way of, of of doing things actually makes a lot of sense as long as you're only rotating about the, when you, when you are rotating about the X, Y, Z axis, because then if you want to rotate about the X axis, you would say one, zero, zero, about the Y axis, zero, one, zero, and about the Z axis, zero, zero, one. And then you just give a simple, you know, how far around that axis. Uh, uh, so in a sense of authoring, this representation can be, much simpler than doing things like Euler angles or certainly quaternion representation. Uh, but, but for an arbitrary rotation, it's, it's not very uh, intuitive what it means. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So let me put in those values and in vermal. And again, th this is a kind of thing which the actual names of these fields, you would use the, the standard reference, the node index to, to get these fields right. Uh, and 
the, the act the actual name of the field to describe where it is is orientation. So I'll quickly type that in. And let me save that and now let me close it and reopen it. And then when we reopen it, we'll see, hopefully, and I'll, I'll even reopen it in my other browser, the View 3D scene. And you see that now we opened it and we've immediately gone to that, uh, the, 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 the viewpoint which I defined earlier. So we still can move it around and Yes. Okay. This scene only had one viewpoint, and I'll leave it at that. But actually, most bright, you can put multiple viewpoints, define multiple viewpoints in a scene. And the browsers generally give you some kind of a menu to look at it in different views. Now, since I only have one viewpoint defined, the only one you see is frontal view. But it, you see, it has a little somersault gig to bring you back to that view. So even if I had moved somewhere else, I can immediately return to the frontal view. There it is. Whoops. Oh. Okay, well, that completes um, what I wanted to put in this simple scene. And I'm going to move on to the idea of, of changing the encoding. So let me, I'm going to quickly check the, the uh, chat box to see if there have been any directions or, or questions. I see that I got some thumbs up for actually having sound. Thank you for that. Um, I'll look in the QA and I don't see any questions in the QA either. So we'll move on to the idea of changing encodings. Get rid of that. Let me close this up. I move on to the second part of this, uh, the second phase, I guess, of, of part one, which was I convert to XML encoding. And I guess it would make sense to go back to uh, and open them, just take a look. remind ourselves what the verbal encoding looks like. It is a text format. It's, it's actually quite, yeah, I think a straightforward syntax. But as, as a text format, I believe verbal is pretty much a, a syntax unto itself. So, and as many of you are familiar with, with the idea that verbal is a standard that predates X3D or, or the other way around, X3D can be seen as the uh, a successor or evolution of verbal. And one uh, thing that was added when it became X3D was the idea of multiple encodings and in particular, putting the same information in an XML file or an XML format. And we're going to see that it, it's more verbose and it has all the maybe complexity of the, of the XML format. Uh, and I know that there are, there are some practitioners who just use Vermal almost uh, exclusively because they don't want to deal with the, com with the syntax complexities of XML. And in fact, we're going to see that the browsers, in many cases, handle Vermal and, X and the XML encoding. Well, they, they do render the same scene. Um, I guess the way to put it is very, we'll see that very often within an XML encoding, you can load in a Vermal file. So in that sense, there's no, meaningful distinction between the XML encoding and the verbal encoding. I, so I'll just quickly say my reason for using XML encoding is because I am interested in CAD files, which very often have hundreds of nodes, XML nodes, uh, 
excuse me, X3D nodes correspond to all the different parts and face of a CAD file. And for that reason, the XML encoding is useful because I can use XML tools such as XL, XSLT, all the parsing tools and processing tools to work with my X3D files when they're in XML encoding. But it's really very easy to go back and forth between the different encodings. And again, this is one of those cases where there's lots of different tools to do that. Uh, again, I'm choosing the direct route, maybe not the shortest route. So I'm actually going to use my view 3D scene browser, which also is kind of a Swiss army knife for converting X3D files. So let me go ahead and open my file. And I'm, I always go back to find it in the folders so I can open it. Open a view 3D scene. And there it is. And one of the options that uh, view 3D scene gives you is to save it in a different format. So as I say, this is already in the Vermal classic encoding. So I want to save it as X3D. pick the wrong button. I actually want to save it as X3D XML encoding. And the, 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 the diff one difference is it traditionally has a different extension X3D rather than X3DV. Let me just hit the save. Now I'm just going to look at it with a text editor. Whoops. And uh, everyone, everyone has their own reaction to seeing raw XML. Uh, a lot of it is um, familiar in terms of the numbers uh, or in terms of the names of the attributes. It's just it has the full XML uh, syntax. But as you, I think you, if, if we were to compare the two files, you'd, you'd see the, the, the relationship between uh, the naming of the attributes. A few defaults have been applied. Uh, you see extra things. And when one interesting thing that the view 3D scene added was a few more of these meta comments, which just explain that it was translated or at least processed by uh, the view 3D scene uh, tool. And just to convince you that it's an, that it, it is the uh, a different encoding, but the same file, I can open it again in either one of my tools and I'll open it in the instant player. And there it is. It, it's really the same view as in the Vermal, same viewpoint. Uh, I guess there's some of the coloring is different. I'm not sure that's just a, but uh, I mean, the shading might be slightly different, but it's really the same scene. So I discussed change in coding. And the last part of my part one is going to be uh, putting this into a web page. So this is going to be using one of the viewers uh, which operates in the browser. I'm gonna close these. And I'll just, what I've done here is I have copied that basic scene uh, into this folder. So, and actually the viewpoint is a little different because I prepared this earlier. So I'll just remind you what it looks like. Well, no, it is the same, or at least I got the viewpoint pretty close. Really the, 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 the the, the, the procedure for putting this in a web page is, is really quite simple if you, you know, accept the idea of a template and uh, at least to get started, this is what I use is I just have these template files 
I've saved them as text, but when I open one up, I will see that it is just HTML. And this is, this is my template that I like to use uh, for viewing this thing in the Excite web browser. In any web browser, but in the Excite X3D viewer. And essentially what we're doing, and this is, H, let me get this out of the way, is we are simply loading in the JavaScript for the Excite uh, viewer. There's also some style sheets associated with it, some simple definitions. And the way I set up my browse, my template is uh, X3D canvas is a feature of the Excite browser. It's where you put your, your scene. And all I need to do is put in the name of my file, which was basic scene. Okay, now this, this attribute is actually uh, really a URL. Uh, I'm going to run everything from this folder. So uh, it really, it's a really a relative URL to look at the, look at the file in the next, you know, in, in the same folder. Let me save this. Here, I'm going to save it as an HTML file. I'm going to call it index.excite.html. And there, okay, there it is. Now, this is the complexity which may be obvious for some of you or you're used to it, particularly if you're web developers, but it also I think it stymies some people who get started with this, is having done this, uh, now how do I look at it on this web page? Because uh, normally an HTML file, it should be uh, viewed from an HTTP server. Uh, and, and that's the way you would publish it on, on your, 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 your organization's website or your web server. But for development purposes, you know, we really don't want to go through all that complexity really of having a whole web server just to look at our prototypes and our practices. So in some cases, you can open this directly from the browser as a file. But as browsers change their security policies, that's becoming increasingly difficult to do. Uh, the feeling is that opening files, opening HTML from the, fi from the uh, file system poses security risk. And generally, the world is moving toward requiring that those be opened from a web, from an HTTP server. But it's really very easy to set up uh, a quick, fast, local uh, HTTP server. And that's, this is where we get to what I mentioned I using Python because my preferred HTTP server is just uh, provided by Python 3. Now it, it does involve some terminal uh, work and I know there are tools out there which will let you open up a local server from uh, a GUI. And again, maybe some of the other X3D experts who do this development work uh, can put those ideas in the, um, in the Q&A question. I'm entering the command line to start my local web server. And I'm going to operate it on the on port 8000. All right. Now let me open up my browser. And all I need to do now is open up my local browser. So localhost port 8000. And I believe I call that index Excite. 
and let's see if it opens. Voila, it opens in, in a, a web page. And, and now what we've done is we, we've managed, we've been able to put our uh, XVD file on a web page and we could have all the other, you know, features of, of, of HTML as documentation for this, uh, for this scene. And again, this can be viewed in any browser. Well, at this point, I, I think it's safe to say any browser. Uh, the, the prerequisite that it, it's, a, it's a web browser that supports WebGL. And I think essentially they all do at this point. And of course, it's also available on the, on the mobile devices as well. I showed you the XI template and now let me quickly show the X3 DOM template, which is a little bit different, but again, we'll have the same results. Here again, okay, so we're loading our JavaScript library from X3 DOM full, x3dom.org. The setup is a little bit different for putting the, where you put the file name. Oh, and I've already got the file name in there. Okay, so let me save this as an HTML file. And let me go to back, back to my web browser and verify that it has opened, that it, it can be opened. I'll put it in the next tab and we can see them both next to each other. Oops, I get it. Oh, I did call it X3 DOM. Okay, I, I misspelled the name, so I'll misspell the name in my request. And there it is. Okay, so now I've, again, it, it, it is essentially the same scene. I mean, it is the same scene viewed on two independent implementations of an X3D viewer on, on two separate web browsers. So I've demonstrated uh, at least so far today, you've seen four separate X3D viewers. The, the view 3D scene, you've seen instant player, you've seen Xsite, which operates in the web browser, and you've seen X3 DOM, which operates in the web browser. And I know that I believe tomorrow's webinar series, we'll be taking a closer look at some of the at, at some of the, our viewers and their own extensions or, or advantages or, and features. So I invite you all to, to uh, attend those. Okay, I believe that kind of concludes the first part. So this is a good time and uh, we're something like halfway through, which is about what I wanted. So this might be a good time to review the question, review the question, I don't see any. Uh, I'm going to take a drink of water and I'll give people a moment. Um, I'm going to take a, a little throat rest for a, a minute or so. If people are welcome to ask either, you know, unmute and ask your question or type it into the chat box. And I know that I see that Don and Nicholas and perhaps Christoph and other people probably have their own um, opinions about what are better tools or better workflows. So you don't have to wait and tell me later that I did it the wrong way. You can tell everyone now. Vince, I think the best workflow is the one you're using. Well, and I, I, I should. person to use yeah. at the time is a good one. And so it's all good. That's the thing. And again, I, 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 again, later on the, in, the, in the webinar series, they're going to be, I believe it's on Thursday, um, a look at some of the authoring tools, which 
kind of replace these this my use of the basic text editor with with things with special X3D features. So and and those can give you a lot of flex, you know, a lot of power. Again, at at the maybe the cost that there, uh, you know, there's a learning curve associated with the, with the tool itself. Okay. Okay, I did have a question about, uh, I, lo I, lo I lost the order to use the tools from mobiles. Okay, I, so this is from, I believe, Jorge. Um, let me just say that we will, these files will be available on the, our, our organization website, you know, these, these folders which go through the different orders. Um, I, again, want to make sure I understand your question or at least answer it usefully is that the X site uh, the X site is a web browser it does work on mobile devices but it's not limited to mobile devices uh, so the X site uh, x3d viewer will work in an HTML page uh, you can use the, the template I gave to put you know, other X3D files on your web page and view it on a mobile device. Um, I don't know if, if that answers your question. Uh, and, I, and, the, and the other thing to say is uh, the initial slide had my email address and, you know, people can certainly email me with more detailed questions or for copies of this, of these, uh, sample files. Let me take another drink. And I promise it's nothing stronger than water. Okay, let me clear the decks a little bit to talk a little bit about uh, it's on everyone's mind because people want to have more 3D content than just a red box floating in yellow space. I'm going to make a big leap forward and talk about how to put an OBJ file uh, in. Uh, well, I, I, ask, I guess it will still be in a yellow space, but it will be a more interesting shape. And when I say I want to put in an OBJ file, the, the tack I'm going to take is I'm actually going to use a tool to convert an OBJ into X3D format uh, and then put that X3D shape in an X3D scene and it will work it just as well in, in, on the desktop browsers and the web browsers. And I, I, I'm being careful that way because one feature of these browsers, particularly View 3D Scene, is it actually will directly read in an OBJ file and show that. Um, and in fact, um, I, I am not going to do it this way, but View 3D Scene can be used to convert an OBJ file into X3D. And perhaps uh, at tomorrow's talk, uh, the, the developer of View 3D Scene and the Castle Game Engine will discuss that. There's lots of ways to convert some files into X3D and one of the objectives of the consortium is to promote those conversion workflows, make more things available as X3D. So this is my advertisement that our executive director wants to make sure I, I make is that if you have questions about how to convert some format into X3D, uh, the Web3D Consortium is a natural place to ask those questions and if you can participate in improving those workflows. So the message is go to our website, view the material, and we encourage participation and membership to help uh, 
move the cause forward. With that commercial time out of the way, I'm gonna go find my PowerPoint. Let me go to part two. Using an OBJ asset in an XVD scene, and I'm using this uh, kind of maybe stilted language because, as we say, in some some browsers do support directly loading in an OBJ file uh, into an X3D scene where you don't have to do any explicit conversion. And related to that, I will say that while we did not do this for OBJ, because quite honestly, and this, this is just my opinion, and this is not an official opinion of the uh, consortium or anyone else, the OBJ is a dead format. The problem is there's oodles of, there's lots and lots of content in OBJ, so we have to support it. But it is not, the, it is not a, a, a format to use for f new future content. However, many people think that GLTF is that format, and I will leave my personal uh, opinion out and simply say that, that that cry has been heard, and in version four of X3D, which is now under development for imminent uh, review as, a, as an international standard, we are supporting or specifying a, a way to uh, directly load GLTF content into an X3D scene. Uh, again, going back to what I'm doing today, I'm going to look at it from the point of view of converting BJ file into X3D. So, and and then then it's available in all my browsers. The tool I want to use is MeshLab, which is an open source uh, toolkit, primarily, for, well, well, for dealing with meshes from its name, uh, but it also does give quite a nice uh, export as X3D. And the thing that I'm going to convert is, uh, and I maybe I'll just show off the. I want to go to this location because I do want to publicize this. But I keep, yes. The Smithsonian Institution has recently put quite a lot of, of 3D content online and, uh, and it's sort of a very, a very permissive licensing uh, and, and there's quite a lot of material out. I am going to use this telegraph key as an example. This is available for download uh, from, this, from this Smithsonian Institute file. I've already downloaded it. So let me leave this and show you my download file. Okay, so the, the, these these are my uh, downloads from 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 uh, the the uh, the Smithsonian. There's an OBJ file, there's a material file, and there is a texture file as a PNG image. I really don't want to talk about the OBJ format because I don't know that much about it. But there it is. This includes three files. So let me go through the process of, of opening it in MeshLab and converting it. I can just open with MeshLab. And is it gonna open up? Yes, there it is, it's verifying MeshLab. It's gonna ask me if I trust it because we live in an untrustful age. Okay, uh, this get, and I have to admit, I get this warning every time I open something from the Smithsonian. Uh, it gives me this warning about something not found, and I've never figured out what the problem is. 
but it always has open fine. We see the, uh, the telegraph key and we see the, that texture image has been used, used to create this sort of realistic uh, wood and metal appearance. And really the, the, the process for converting this to, uh, to uh, an XVD file is really quite straightforward. Really just open it as an OBJ file and save it as X3D. But th there is one step which I hope I, by showing you this, I can, I can save some uh, confusion or maybe shorten your, your conversion workflows. And that is that I, we mentioned earlier that in X3D, the typical units, we think of them as being meters. Uh, that's sort of this de default unit. Even though X3D has been used to visualize galaxies or at least supernova, and I believe Dr. Paulus will be showing some examples in the near future of X3D visualizing uh, particle physics experiments where the, <laughs> the unit is femtometers. Uh, but X3D, we usually think of the units as being meters, while in these OBJ models, very often. Uh, the default units are millimeters. In other words, these X3D models, excuse me, these OBJ models tend to be big. And mesh layout gives you a nice way to quickly read off the size of, a, of a, the bounding box or the size of this model. So what I did here was I used the render menu to show the box corners. And I hope you can see the box corners. They're these kind of these green edges. But the important uh, information is it gives you a display saying that uh, in terms of the units in this, and the, uh, the coordinates that the mesh is defined in, the box is 169, say 170 units in the X direction, 76 in the Y direction, 50 in the Z direction. And we saw earlier that, um, the, the, that simple red box I showed, it was convenient or it, it showed up well with a default viewpoint when my uh, units were like small multiples of one. So make a long story short, uh, this thing is about 50 times too large to really, you know, it's about 50 times larger than that red box. So we either, either have to make this smaller or I have to make, I have to pull my viewpoint way out uh, to see this. And it's a matter of preference, you as a, as the content author, which one you wanna do. Uh, I am going to choose to make this smaller in the X3D file. So I'm not gonna use Mesh Lab to change this mesh. I'm gonna export it at the same size. And in a moment, I'll show how to make it smaller in the X3D file. So let me, uh, I'm gonna export the mesh. Now th it has a, lo a lot of, uh, or it has a couple of options for exporting it. And th this is a case where we're kind of, uh, in some cases where we're, we're, we can omit options which don't affect anything. So, because the color of the mesh is determined by the texture, we really don't need to export a color on each face. And I'm gonna make the decision not to export the normal vectors. It does make the, the, the file um, significantly smaller not to export normals, but in some applications, it might be useful to include the normals for higher uh, fidelity or better rendering. But it is important to include the texture coordinates. I'm gonna add this, the, the I, X3D can use the same image texture. So that's okay. I do okay. And in a moment, it should ask me where I want it. Is it going to ask me where I want it? I didn't get to my dialogue. Let me try that again. X3D, 
export mesh as, oh, I know what I did wrong. Okay. I must hit the wrong key. I want to export it. Mesh Lab supports a number of, of mesh formats or file formats. We can see that it sort of has, includes the legacy Vermal format. That is Vermal as it was before it was part of the X3D standard. But I'm going to choose the X3D format. And I'm actually going to put it in my, okay, I, I, I actually had already done this, but I will, I will export them again as well. Uh, so let me, I'll just copy over. You see, I, I had already done this, but I will save it. Yeah, I want to replace it, yes. And I'm asking the same question. So I, I'm going to choose to not include normal. I don't want the colors, but I do need the tech coordinate, texture coordinates. So that's okay. And it takes a moment. All right. Let me look at my exports file and I see I've, I got an X3D and just as it, oh, I, the texture format, this texture image PNG was not automatically uh, moved. So I guess to be explicit, I should include this step where I copy this file and I move it into my exports file. Normally, this would not have been automatically put there. I mean, this would not have been there by uh, Mesh Lab. I, would, I had to move it myself. And since I, when I was practicing, I did that. That's why it's already there. OK, just as a check, let's open this file um, with one of our browsers and see how it looks. Now, open with Instant Player. Okay, let me get rid of my old thing. Okay, there it is, an instant player. And it kind of looks like we're looking at the corner of the moon, I guess. And this is, again, that size problem. Uh, this thing was, again, was the dimensions of it were, were about 50 by 70 by 170. And we're only 10 units away. So, you know, we're probably stuck up against an edge. Now, uh, X. The instant player has got a convenient uh, thing where you can automatically show, you can automatically have it zoom out to show you the whole thing, and there it is. But ordinarily, you would not want to require a user to, to do that step. You would want to show them right away uh, the model. So now I'm going to talk about the idea of taking our X3D export of the shape itself and putting it into uh, a scene which has all the features we learned about earlier, a viewpoint, maybe a background color, you know, perhaps even some lighting. So I'm going to do that work in a different folder called X3D Edited. And you can see I've already done as sort of my, my practice, I've done quite a bit. So let me go through the steps. I had already copied in my X3D file and the texture, so everything is there. I copied in my basic scene that I did earlier. And you can see my basic scene just had a box as a shape. And this is what I want to do. I want to go into my X3D file from, from Mesh Lab. And I just want to copy that uh, shape out of there and just paste it into this. And really, and let, let me go back to when I first got interested in X3D or one of the things that attracted me to it was you could do these operations of cutting and pasting items from a scene graph just using a text editor, uh, which, which to me was terrific. Uh, it means I didn't need any special tools to create X3D content and I could modify them really in any way Anything that I could think of to do with the text editor 
or text processing software I could use to author and create X3D scenes. So to me, even though this is kind of a simple operation, just cutting and pasting from one file to another, to me, that's still kind of the, one of the very important features, I'll put it that way, of the X3D standard, is that you, you, you can do quite a bit with nothing more than a text editor. So let me open my X3D scene. Now this is a case where I say nothing more than a text editor, but actually to be honest, this X3D file is 10 megabytes. Now, you know, it is a tribute to the BB edit text editor that it opens that scene of 10 megabytes of character of text, you know, without hiccuping really too much. And in fact, another neat feature of it is that as an X, because it's XML, it can kind of collapse that shape into just uh, three little dots. If I open this up, which I won't, you would see a whole lot of numbers for all those 10 megabytes of coordinates defining that mesh. But given that, all I have to do is cut it out of this one. Well, let, first of all, let me get rid of this. And now let me bring in this idea I talked earlier about. I want to make this thing smaller because again, the, the file exported from Mesh Lab had dimensions about 50 by 70 by 160, uh, which is too big, uh, at least for the default viewpoint. So in, in X3D, uh, the, the way we can modify kind of globally those shapes is through a transform node. The transform node is what lets you rotate, move, and rescale a shape. And it's, again, now we're working in XML, so we have to follow all the XML rules about closing brackets. And transform, the way I change the size of something is the, the scale attribute. And by checking the node index in the standard, you would see that the scale attribute has three numerical parameters corresponding to scaling along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. We want to do uniform scaling. I basically want to make this thing 50 times smaller or a factor of 0 0.02. So uniform scaling among all. All right. Now, now the magic. I just cut it out of this and I paste it into this. It does, oh, okay. So it did decide to open it up for me, but it, it, it did not. Fortunately, it's written out as along a very long line. Uh, but you can see that for, for, for this model, it's still a shape. We still see the idea of an appearance, but it, in this case, the appearance is, is retrieved or created from an image, that, that texture file. And the index face set is essentially the name for, is one way of, of having a mesh in, uh, in X3D. But that's really all you need. And so now let me save this. I'm gonna save it as, a different name and let me call it, I'll call it telegraph.x3d. Okay, so again, I had done this earlier as part of a practice session, so I can just replace my older practice. Uh, now let me, again, open up that folder again. Again, my X3, here's the file I just worked on. And now let me try opening it in, again, one of my browsers. I will open it in View 3D Scene, for example. Uh, 
I think Dan is going to, because who knows where that. Okay, and it opened up. So if you remember, let me, I'm going to get rid of the bounding boxes. I, I'm not a big fan of the bounding box when I'm not debugging. Okay, so what have we done? We've cut and pasted that telegraph instead of the simple red box. Now the viewpoint, it is a, it is a defined viewpoint, but it, in, for the telegraph, it's probably not a very good viewpoint to look at it from underneath. I'm not gonna go through the process of changing the viewpoint again, but for example, this I think might be a better viewpoint for showing off the telegraph and actually maybe zooming in a little bit so it fills it. So you know, prior to publication, I would do that same trick with instant, actually, is Michaelis on the call? I don't see. Maybe Michaelis will tell us if there's an easy way to get the viewpoint out of view 3D scene. But we could do that same trick with instant player of getting that position and orientation from this viewpoint, just typing those into the file and making this the default, the default viewpoint. Uh, so now we see the same thing in, uh, in view 3D scene. Just for kicks, let me just check that it opens up as well in Instant Player. There it is. Again, not a very good scene. Not a very good viewpoint, perhaps. That would probably be, would be a nicer viewpoint. And all that we did with putting things on the browser works just the, just the same way. I have to close this one. So I'm gonna demonstrate that. I'm putting things on a web page. Again, I have to go back to my, oh. Let me open up this Telegraph HTML just to show the end result. Okay, this is, this is the HTML page. I did the same procedure using the X3 DOM template. It's really the, exactly the same template. The only thing I did was change the, uh, where it loads from to that telegraph.x3d. Okay, so at this point I can do that same trick of starting a local web browser. Let me open up telegraph.html. It does take a little bit longer to load because it is a larger file. And again, I apologize. It, somehow my, I, I got the viewpoints backwards and that, and that viewpoint comes from when I did the original red box, I forgot what the red box looked like when it was turned into a telegraph. But there it is. So uh, just a, I guess you call it a few simple steps. I've uh, put the uh, model of the, of the telegraph from Smithsonian uh, on a web page, uh, ready to go to be published that way. With any other comment I might have uh, included in the web page. So I'm, this is another break for me to uh, look, check the questions or maybe open it up. This is kind of a natural, another natural break point before I go into part three of the webinar. 
And I, th I think our time is pretty much what I, what I had hoped for. Uh, the part three is a little bit late. It, we're getting into more complex uh, material and you know, at a little bit even a lighter level. So it may be, some of you may be looking forward to that, some of you maybe not. But uh, let me stop, take a break here, another water break, and ask if you'd like to ask a question with your microphone or, or type something in or comments. And it's, it, we will make all these example files and the slides, you know, will be available on the Web3D Consortium website, you know, linked from that same webinar link, which is at the top of our chat, we will have links where you can get all these sample files and, and, and the slides that have the, 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 you could follow the links to the tools. And of course, the, the consortium website itself has all kinds of material, including the, the, the text of the standards documents, which when I do this work, actually the standards documents is my primary reference uh, for remembering what all the attributes are called and what the precise syntax is. Reset. <clears throat> check. Oh, let me, I, I guess I can, oh, there's something in the QA. So let me check that now. Hmm. Okay, I've got to reduce the windows I've got because it says that there's QA questions, but I cannot see them. So I think it just means I have too many things open on the screen. Let me go back to playing this. I'm just closing some of my windows so I can figure out what the questions are. Okay, I, I think I found it, where my QA is. Okay. Okay, so this is a very good question. Uh, how much of the old Vermal standard is supported via X3D? Um, and I will say this, and you know, perhaps Don and Nicholas will, will, will think of some kind of example, but I think the answer is all of it. Uh, Don, are you willing to, the th certainly the things which you have asked asked in your question, Brian, about sound, proximity, test, animation, those are all supported in X3D. And in a moment when I go to part three, we'll at least be looking at some of those uh, features such as animation and sensors. Uh, so I, I, I hesitate to say 100%, but Basically, X3D is a superset of a vermal. Uh, so there, there's the vermal nodes, the vermal capabilities, and, and then things have been added in, in the natural evolution. And one thing which I believe was not in vermal but was added to X3D was uh, the volumetric rendering style, which you know is the kind of thing you see in medical imaging. But Again, Don and Nicholas, you can chime in, but I believe all essentially all of Vermal, the all of the old Vermal is supported in X3D. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's that's correct. <laughs> and um, uh, it goes back to uh, a neat little trick, um, by the way, is that you had launched your um, example with um, that sort of classic Vermal encoding, the UTF-8. 
yes. uh, which you started with your box. Um, that's exactly what Vermal 2 looks like. And if you're in that file and you have a Vermal 2 header, you just change the 2 to a 3. Right. <laughs> Save it as X3DV. Yes. And now you've got uh, that equivalent scene graph uh, labeled as an X3D scene graph. So this, the same features are supported plus the superset is a, is a good description. And I will say that in my own experience in sort of working with CAD is very often there are, there are, there are computer aid design programs which say they export in Vermal and they put out a file which is with a WRL extension. And it, it, those tend to not have the features of proximity you mentioned, but those WRL files, I could use them exactly equivalently. I don't even have to change the header as Nicholas pointed out. Those will go right into View 3D Scene and uh, X and Instant Player. You know, so yes, so. Yeah, and uh, Vince, you mind uh, uh, hitting the off button on the uh, screen share for a moment? Okay. We push on this point. This is this is a really important point, and you know the key letter here, uh, staring some of us in the face on this interface, is the X. The X in X3D, and it's extensible. You can add stuff, and, and that's uh, prototypes, that's scripting, that's inlining def views of content. Uh, but it also, it also goes to our, our, our working group's fundamental design principles from Vermal all the way to today. And, and it's, it's really interesting because here we go. You, you say, what, what a rash statement is this? Well, we have content that from 1997 and every year since that <clears throat> works, it still works. It not only renders, but you can interact with it. It can animate. And uh, that's kind of unheard of. And then we went to from Vermal 97 to some mods to X3D, where we solidified all of that. And then we went 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. Now we're going into 4.0 and, and the classic term, term most people are familiar with is backwards compatibility. Okay, and, and how do you be careful about not losing stuff? Well. One translation of backwards compatibility is I got a heavy bag of luggage on my shoulder and I'm carrying all this old stuff I don't really want anymore. And uh, so how did we avoid that? Well, here's, here's a twist. We think of it as forward compatibility, forward compatibility. I mean, oh, standards are a little slower to adopt, but that's because we're ever so careful. We're, we don't put something in there before it's time because we don't want to have to carry that luggage later. Every time we add stuff, it's been tested at least two independent ways. It's got stuff in industry. So it's the forward and backwards compatibility, both at the same time, that makes it really interesting. So here we are today. We're on the cusp of x 3 d 4 yep. We still got that big X. We can go into all these new places and uh, personally, I love it when somebody posts on the mail list, hey, here's something I can't do because you never get a pity party of people sitting around, oh, yeah, I can't do that. It's more, oh, well, what if we try this? And what about the other thing? And oh, look, somebody did that already. What if we, so uh, there's my vote for the letter X today. Okay. Let's go back and uh, I think uh, we had a real good question from Greg. So let me bring it up. First of all, am I, oh. Let me share the correct screen. I wanna share the screen. I keep messing up. I keep sharing the, the incorrect screen.
Okay, so uh, we had a, a good question from Greg. Uh, he asked, is it possible to use the web viewing ability to place a 3D viewer within the bounds of a greater 3D viewer? And I think he's talking about the idea of having a, a 3D scene and then maybe like a what's sometimes called a, a window within a window, a, a smaller, maybe magnified view of some file. And I'll answer your question by saying, that's not a standard feature where you'd have, you know, a, a model and then some, you know, little uh, enlarged region. But I think it's something you can do within the X3D uh, programming and interactivity. I think that was, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of ways to do it uh, within the standard X3D you know, set of nodes where you could have a, a close up view as sort of a sub, you know, within your larger view. And I'm sure Nicholas and Don are both thinking of their ways to do it. So I'm gonna answer that with a, with a yes. And I think that's a great idea. And again, this is the kind of thing that, you know, this is the kind of challenge that our members really, really like. Uh, Particularly, that's the kind of idea which could be punted off to our uh, usability working group, which is a working group within the consortium, which is I, looking at, at how to make 3D content more usable in the user interface. And so, uh, uh, so yes, I, I think you can, uh, you know, my, my honest answer, Greg, is there is no node, there is no current X3D node called view within a view, but I think we can do what you described and I think you've given us a neat idea to try. And then another, uh, would it be possible to create a 3D, an X3D scene of a whole city performance wise? Um, I, I'm gonna answer that yes, <laughs> just because I, I sort of think that anything is possible if you're, if you're ingenious and have good tools. Uh, and I will say that, you know, and I, again, I will uh, talk about the Web3D 2020 conference coming up. It's a virtual conference in November. And I, we have uh, several great submissions for the academic program. And I I'm quite confident that some of those academic papers are pertinent to that question of showing large geospatial scenes in an X3D scene. So, uh, you know, to the anonymous attendee who asked that, I'm going to give a yes in the sense that it, it, this is the kind of thing which is an area of active interest and development by our members. So I, I invite you to learn more about that. Okay, um, get back and I, I, I do really do intend to end this part before noon. So this is gonna be a little bit lighter. And uh, you know, again, this material will be on the, the uh, webinar page. Let, first of all, I wanna make sure that, that I'm sharing the right screen. So if, uh, put into the chat whether I'm sharing the correct screen. And I see there's some new things. So Don or Nicholas, can you just confirm for me that I'm sharing my PowerPoint slide that says part three? Because I get mixed up with which I'm working on dual screens. Yes, <laughs> we'll be we are, we are Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about adding some of these extra features to, to uh, an X3D scene. And my platform is going to be a web platform called Glitch, which is a general development platform for uh, people doing web work. So let me, I'm going to try to open the page and then show you the Glitch page. Glitch is organized as projects. And you can see I put up three projects demonstrating some feature of, of X3D, and I'll be talking about one and maybe two of these today. And I will say that uh, this glitch really is a, 
I am not the only person putting um, X3D related material on Glitch. And so if you were to search, come back to this later, it's glitch.com and search X3D and X3DOM and Xsite, you would find many, many more neat examples of how to do neat things using X3D in a web page. And very often that, that, that will work for, for the desktop as well. So the, the first example I wanna show, and in, you know, depending on the time, maybe the only example, is how to do uh, add some interactivity. And what I mean by that is you can do more than just spin it around. And I'm gonna show a project which I call Heads Up Laser. So it take, does take a moment or so for the thing to load. We're looking at a live demonstration on Glitch. So there's sort of the, the loading process. Okay, this is in the Excite web browser. Um, this is a, 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 a 3D model, it's a, it's a CAD model of, and this, this is it's called a laser assembly. I, I, it came off an archive of, of, of CAD projects. So I'm not really sure what the, you know, what the laser was for, but I had to assume that this is a lens. And the feature which I have added, the interactive feature, is that when you mouse over a particular part, it, it, it highlights. It, it, you know, in this case, it turns kind of red. Now, by itself, that, that's maybe, maybe not so uh, interesting, but you can see this is, you know, leads you to a whole, this is the gateway to a whole lot of interactive features where you can explore this model just by mousing over different parts and different things will happen as you mouse over different parts. In this case, it, it highlights, it shows up. And so what I want to show is the, the model into uh, how this is implemented uh, using the, the, the programming model, I guess you call the event model that's uh, specified in X3D. And what I'm going to show you is, is although it's working in a web page, uh, in a web browser, environment, uh, this, this, this same uh, programming will work in the desktop browsers as well. So it's independent of, of it being uh, in a web environment. I think my PowerPoint slide had a, a quick, a little bit of an overview of the basic idea here is, okay, I, I'll show you this in the course, but the, my, the, the very cartoony way is, uh, it's called an event model. And in a minute, I'll show you what the source looks like. There's a thing called laser touch and it, it, it kind of waits for the mouse to go over it. And when the mouse gets over it, it sends a message or a, an event, which is received by a, another node called a laser highlight, which we'll see is really just the light. And uh, it, turns on, it turns that light on. And similarly, when you stop touching the laser, when the mouse is no longer over, that event will turn the light off. So let me, let's take a look and see how it looks in the raw, H, in the raw X3D code. So uh, Glitch allows us to view the source. Oh, when I want to view the laser model. So here it is in full glorious uh, XML, XML encoding. Uh, and I chose this because the parts we want to look at are close to the surface. And let me use, let me zoom in a little bit to make the screen bigger. So this was actually done in a, a pretty straight, you know, actually a, a very simple way. Uh, 
you you might see some reference to some uh, these are x these are uh, nodes which are in the latest or they're in x x three d now they were not in the original vermal so they may be unfamiliar if if you're really only familiar with vermal I have a node called CAD assembly which is a grouping node you can have lots of of, of CAD faces or CAD parts in a CAD assembly. That's something that was added uh, a few years ago to enhance X3D's usability in, in the, for purposes of computer-aided design applications. But there, there are two active nodes, which I talked about earlier. There's one called a touch sensor. And again, that's that thing which, uh, is just always waiting for the mouse to either go over it or the mouse to click it. And really all I need to do is declare that there is a touch sensor. Everything else is part of the X3D standard. The behavior of this touch sensor is defined in the specification. And that is why a touch sensor will work the same in XI, in X3DOM, in view 3 d scene, and in well, any, any browser which conforms to the standard, the touch sensor will behave the same way. I've got, also got a light now in the, in the model earlier, I did not use a directional light, I used a point light, but still it's a light which turns on and off. And uh, one of the features, and I, I think is that unless you, uh, specifically declare that a light is what's called global, a light only works within a group that it contains it. So uh, I have cleverly contained the light and the touch sensor within a group that just contains this CAD part, the laser. And that's the thing that I wanted to, to light up, to be highlighted. So I define a touch sensor, which is waiting for that mouse to go over it. I define a directional light, which has an attribute. And let's see if I can show that attribute in the, yes, uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, I gotta move this thing over. Okay, if, if you look at this directional light, you see way at the end, I've turned the on to false. But what you can see is that the last step in my programming is I define what's called a root, which is kind of a, a, a jack with an input and an output, or a cable with an input and an output. And this cable goes from the laser touch node from the field that's called is over. And that's the thing that's gonna light up, or actually it's gonna go from false to true when the mouse goes over it. And the, the output end of the jack goes to the other node, the laser highlight, and the field which is, which is called on. And so when this touch sensor feels that mouse go over it, it is over, goes from false to true. That transition is an event, and it is sent to this other node, and it turns the on from false to true, and we get that visual appearance. And the same thing happens when the, when is over, when that touch sensor feels that it's, the mouse is no longer over, it makes a transition from true to false, and that event is routed or sent to the directional light. So going back, I believe we can, I can go back and just show this again. So is over is false, it jumps to true, gets sent to that light that turns the light on, and now is over goes from true to false. That event gets sent over from to the light, it turns off. And this is just a real simple case of turning something on and off, but X3D, the event model leads, it supports all kinds of cascading and read and branching events in and out. So really some very complex interaction models can be uh, created using these events to make you know, the, 
really the type of behavior you would want or need. And as a, the, the final, uh, if you really can't do what you want using these events from one node to the other, there is also the capability of sending everything to an embedded script and we support scripting in JavaScript uh, and, 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 and using, you know, conventional uh, procedural programming to interpret your events and, and to create new events. Let me just check this. I'm gonna check my QA. And because of time, you wanna leave some time for discussion before Dr. Paulus is, I am choose to just point you to the glitch example of the controlled motion. Let me go to that and start it up. And I'll just, uh, you know, perhaps demonstrate it and just give a, a, a very bird's eye view of what's going on here. This is a case of a CAD model of a little assembly and the, the feature I'm trying to demonstrate is by using this slider, I can essentially disassemble it. Okay, and that's pretty simple. But again, it, it, the, the, the significant features here are is that uh, the, the animation or the motion is done in very much the same way that nodes are changing their properties and, and, and signaling those changes uh, via events to other nodes. In this case, we are changing, the thing we are changing are the transform nodes which can determine where all these different parts are drawn. So by, at a bird's eye view, that's how we're doing the animation, is we send events to those transform nodes, which specify how individual parts, the washer, the nut, are rotated and moved. But the one thing which is maybe a little bit new is that the source of all these events ultimately uh, is an HTML, element. So what's different about this model opposed to the other one is my user input isn't something within the X3D scene. It's actually an HTML5 slider. And we have inputs, we have methods of converting those HTML5 events and converting them into X3D events, which then determine uh, the what the scene looks like, modify the scene, send events in that scene. So this gives you a whole other avenue for creating interactive graphics. Uh, with that, I am going to uh, pause for questions and uh, again, comments and take a little break. And uh, my intention is that we be ready for Nicholas Paulus to start at, on schedule at noon, uh, but I love to hear comments or questions or QAs from anyone. Uh, look in the Qs again, the Q and As. Okay, I don't see any new questions. Okay, I got a question came out. What knowledge is a prerequisite for someone who's new to this? So that's a broad question. Uh, let me let me. Let me put it this way. I, if you're coming from someone who really would like a, an introduction, uh, and I think he's left, so he won't get a swelled head too much, but Dr. Dom Brutzman, who was on earlier and discussing, I think he just said that he had to leave. He and uh, Leonard Daly have a, have a book out called X3D, which is uh, readily available, and there's even a website about it. Uh, if you're asking, you know, what's the best way to just simply start from scratch, I would say that book called X3D is a really good start. Is it, you know, sort of, sort of the basics of 3D graphics as well as X3D. And I will put it this way, it's kind of a tribute to the stability of the standard that even though that book is, and I, you know, 
let's just say well over a decade old, it is still largely valid and useful. There is nothing in that book which is wrong. It's just there's more things that have been added to X3D which is not covered in the book. But it's, it's not as if we've changed the architecture of X3D and the book is now obsolete. Everything in that book is ready, is ready for usage. Uh, and if you're asking what's the best place to start with X3D, I would recommend that book, X3D, uh, Don Brutzman and Leonard Daly. Okay, is there anything? Uh, more? Uh, Nicholas, are you? I, I, first of all, Nicholas, are you still on or are you falling asleep? <laughs> no, of course, I'm here. Okay, I'm, I'm just trying to arrange his hand off if no one has any questions. One of the things that our, our boss wants me to do is to pause the recording. I, I should say stop recording and then start recording. Uh, so that way we can be distributed independently of each other, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, hey, Vince, before you do that, um, I, I, there, this might be a question for, um, that sort of came up with uh, earlier. We'll, um, and I'll definitely get to some resources in my uh, presentation about ways to, to learn and use this. But looking at your examples, they're really cool. So how do I get, um, uh, you know, an X3D file that has stuff like CAD parts in it? I mean, what are some, oh. some options to like to get those washers and the bolts things out of, a, you know, a CAD program or something? Okay, well, I mentioned, well, um, if what you have is a CAD program and actually the, the I know, well, the advertisement for the, uh, design, printing, and scanning working group, uh, we've actually, that's been an active area is, is how to convert or translate material from CAD to X3D. Uh, if you're into CAD, you may know that sort of the current standard for CAD interchange is called STEP. And we have been doing a lot of active work on converting STEP files into X3D scenes. And so, there you would have a CAD file and whatever AutoCAD parametric, you know, all those high-end CAD routines, you export as step and then use one of the, uh, then use a workflows to convert step to an X3D. And there's, again, there's more information on that uh, at our website. Uh, there, that also will be a topic quite likely at the Web3D 2020 conference. In, eight weeks. Uh, so that, that, again, I invite you to come, you know, vis visit our website and check out our working group. Finally, and I'll close with this is, as I mentioned, very often those uh, CAD programs will also export and they'll, they'll say export in Vermal. And as we said, if you export as Vermal, you can directly use it as an X3D geometry. Now, again, when, when the CAD file exports it, they're not gonna export all this animation and cool sensors and stuff. So that's, that's up to the X3D author. But it's, the geometry is available in, in the Vermal export. I see, okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, well, look, I will introduce our, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Nicholas Polis. And I don't remember the title of his, <laughs> don't remember the title, but he will explain it. But if, in a moment uh, here, so if you give me a moment, I am going to stop sharing. And I'm going to, let's see, stop recording. <laughs>